I said, it's going to introduce, uh, and again, our, our fellow Rotarians from Vashon Island. Good morning, everyone. My name is Eliza Steele, the Vice President for Fashion Island Livery. Uh, I'm at the International Service Chair, and we are the lead on this project. Um, and Marina is with TAG Organization, which is a cooperating organization, and so they're the ones in Myanmar facilitating this project. Um, so just a little bit about this project is that it's a maternal health brand. Um, we ended up partnering with about six other clubs. So we partnered with Seattle Four, Bellevue, Mercer Island, Ballard, and Murray Club of Jerusalem. And so um, it was my first time writing a global brand, and so it was a really amazing experience to learn just how this network of really works. And so I'm really excited to share with you what took us about two years to work on this. The whole process of getting all everything formed, writing a grant, um, getting partners, getting the grant approved with Rotary International, and then now it's actually up and running. And it's been going on for a little over six months. And it's a pilot program that um, is addressing maternal health issues in Myanmar. And it's using the infrastructure of um, what the government already has going of education for midwives and then auxiliary midwives as well for the ones that infiltrate deep into the rural areas. And so there was a needs assessment done, which is a major part of getting a global brand, is that you have to go and actually meet with the people there, have discussions, um, so that it's not just coming in, like this is what you need, it's more um, adapting to what their needs are. And so the needs, were, needs assessment was done, and then we went in, um, and it's supplementing the education that they already have. So it's already, that's I guess the really great thing about this project is using the system that's already going on and not trying to create a new one. Um, and so with that, I would like Marina's gonna come up and she's gonna talk a little bit about the organization and then we're gonna get more into the nuts and bolts of A Drop of Milk, which is the name of the project. What about Marina? Can you tell us about her? Um, so Marina works with TAG. She is the country director. She's the director of operations. Sorry, that's my English. <laughs> um, and uh, we've been working together for actually is it about three years now. That um, so they do work in Myanmar already, which she's going to talk a little bit about. So they've been in Myanmar working for about six years now. And um, the Rotary Club of being gone actually contacted them because they realized that there was a huge need um, in this aspect of their country. And since TAG was already there, they already have um, really great relationships with the people there and work, that are working. Um, they felt like they were a great connection to do this project. And so then it got brought over here. So they're the host club, and then they need the lead international club, and that's where it started trying to find, and then it kind of went through a whole bunch of ordinary clubs in the district, um, but everyone kind of was doing other projects and too much going on. In Fashion Island, you know, we had some major big hitters that did international grants or global grants, um, but they had kind of moved to different areas in different rotary clubs, so we got to partner with them. So anyway, from here to find you. <laughs> Without further ado. <laughs> So, um, we're going to just um, do a double act, um, since this is the best way as a cooperating organization to work with Rotary. Um, just a, a kind of a couple of sentences about myself. I'm, uh, I was born in Russia, we moved to Israel when I was uh, about 10, so I grew up in Israel and did a lot of work on Israeli Palestinian issues when I was uh, sort of pre and post military service and um, ended up in the United States on scholarship and actually went to apply that um, to international development context. Um, interestingly enough, my first posting was in Sri Lanka, so and actually met my husband in Sri Lanka too, so the, whatever was happening this week has really hit home for me. I spent um, two years in Sri Lanka working on um, the Tamil Sinhalese conflict, um, applying actually the work we were doing in Israel at the time on Palestinian Israeli post trauma and um, trauma working with children and education systems, and 
look at how, because there's a lot of similarity between the concept, how this can be kind of um, shared across in other countries where similar situations are going on. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's um, since then I've worked in, uh, see, about eight different countries in development. I've lived uh, in the UK for seven years. Uh, I did my master's in development at Tufts University Fletcher School, as everybody knows, Massachusetts. Um, and so um, I joined TAG right when we started, actually, with the concept of, um, I was in the UK at the time, and um, uh, sort of the mission of what is Israel has to offer to the development world, given that it has gone through a lot of its own development very rapidly in sort of the 70 years almost that it's been in existence. Um, and um, actually what we can do that is benefiting the world. Um, and so looking at, um, at that, this is the mission of the organization, is think about applied and shared knowledge that empowers local communities. Uh, we have grown quite a bit since then. I'll talk a little bit about kind of our focus areas, but um, we have uh, relocated here, of course, with Amazon <laughs> um, through my husband, and then sort of um, because I was um, leading on a lot of the operational um, engagement of the organization, um, ended up opening an office here in Seattle, which has a huge amount of global health work happening. It's a great location to be in. Um, and now we have sort of a, a small office with really reliant volunteers. The majority of our resources go back to the country, so we keep each group very, very small. Um, and in general, kind of the way we work is also we bring um, and experts who are volunteers. So we only have no cost, and uh, we build um, our operations on the ground through local teams and capacity building of local um, uh, sort of uh, staff experts because that means we leave behind the people who have the knowledge rather than bring them in and out and out on, on sort of um, much more costly missions. Um, so I want to show you a, a one minute movie about kind of the birth of the idea of drop of milk and why the name of this project is Global Brand is Drop of Milk and then we'll go back into kind of uh, telling you a little bit about the project and, and sharing with you a few more things. And I don't know if you have the Timekeeper, because I tend to go over, so maybe if somebody can give me, give us like a 10 minute oh, warning of some sort. I'll throw a warning. Right, that's great. So, how do I go to the movie? Sorry. <laughs> Established to provide education on pregnancy, birth, and infant care. Tipat Chalav now has more than 1,000 clinics in Israel. The service helped Israel achieve an infant mortality rate among the lowest in the world. TAG brings Drop of Milk to Myanmar with the same goal in mind. Drop of Milk implements effective monitoring during pregnancy, enhanced hygiene and sanitation, and child development education to community health workers. Through Drop of Milk, TAG provides improved medical equipment and extensive training and support. Reinforced by a mobile technology hospital referral system, TAG ensures mothers and babies have access to the vital care they need and deserve. The project will train more than 150 community health workers responsible for 138 villages and 83,000 people. Focus on three impact areas because we believe in a holistic approach 
the three affected areas are creating sustainable livelihoods, and that's how we usually start with, uh, because developing countries, number one priority, obviously, is how do I put food on the table, how do I provide better nutrition for my children, how do I afford for kids to go to school. Uh, we have a particular focus on generating social enterprises, um, and that's where we invest a lot of our resources. When we were looking at uh, which countries we want to, so I missed the slide where I talked about where we operated. We operated across 12 countries, but in terms of Southeast Asia, Myanmar is where we really decided it was a strategic priority um, because it's one of the poorest countries in Southeast Asia, but it's second largest. It's almost 60 million people with ears <coughs> and it's totally closed down. And I'll talk a little bit more later about kind of where maternal health, where it is maternal uh, health. But when we entered Myanmar um, at the time, I remember arriving there sort of first time about six years ago, if you didn't bring cash with you, you were stuck. There was no way to kind of, um, you know, get money out. Um, There's no way to get um, access to cell phones. Uh, it was just opening up with a kind of um, transfer to a more open uh, regime. Since then, as you know, about four years ago, there were three years ago elections, and then some Suchi won. However, it didn't necessarily bring what, uh, kind of the, the openness and the addressing some of the issues around human rights that kind of the global community was hoping for. But it's definitely opened up more than um, where it was throughout the last 60 years of a very, very difficult military regime. Um, so still, um, there's significant amount of issues in the country. Um, there's lots of areas that still have ongoing conflict going on. You're probably uh, aware of the Rohingya crisis, um, and I'll show you the map where it is. It's not affecting the areas where we work, but certainly um, affecting in terms of kind of the dynamic with ethnic minorities um, and things like that. Um, so we, when we entered Myanmar, we decided that we're actually going to be based on a lot of needs assessment, a lot of working with lots of stakeholders, and we were going to be focusing on beekeeping. The reason why we wanted to focus on beekeeping is because we wanted to create um, an initial platform uh, of uh, an opportunity to generate income. But since most of the country is dependent on agriculture, over 75 percent, and that's where most of the poverty is. Uh, we wanted something that relates to impacting crops, but that does not depend on land ownership because that obviously means that women are less able to be involved. Um, and also that creates connection between different ethnic minority groups. So beekeeping allows you to generate income very quickly. It's an investment in resources and um, training. Within three, four weeks, somebody with hives can out of um, uh, sort of uh, local beekeeping that was going on already. Um, the price of honey in the country was like a dollar a kilo. Now, five years later, we have a UN funded grant. They make it $13 a kilo from the honey, selling it as prime, uh, as kind of premier brand, benefiting mm -hmm. almost 100,000 people, allowed us to build a lot of um, understanding of work with local community and we have done since then a lot of other work including agriculture but um, yeah stimulating social enterprises and understanding where do you enter to bring the best value for money that creates the best output for the communities is how we usually kind of operate our next um, impact area is empowering youth at risk we know from working in, in global uh, kind of south that countries that there's a significant number of um, underserved youth, that the countries that have more issues of violence, conflict, and war. Um, in Myanmar, there is um, a very high percentage of youth um, under 25 who have no very little opportunity. The education system are very underdeveloped. The farming and agriculture is being kind of transformed very quickly, but um, that's where it used to be what the youth used to do, the continue the farming with their families and they're not making money out of it anymore. So they are, you know, resorting to drugs and and other things or being getting involved in conflict. So we actually partnered with Microsoft and we're doing um, a, a 
technology, social um, impact programming there, or training, or capacity building, the youth that are going into um, uh, sort of um, continuing education to understand how technology can provide opportunities for creating local solutions for their issues. And we just ran an amazing hackathon uh, three months ago where they came out, where the youth had to go through a process where they were taught to think outside of what they used to, because the education system is very, very different there, and come up with the most incredible idea of how to solve their own social challenges. They got mentors from across the world, including a lot from Asia, Microsoft Asia, but not just Microsoft, and um, um, the, the team that won um, with some re really interesting um, enterprise ideas uh, around kind of dealing with their garbage, kind of recycling garbage into uh, products um, is actually getting support now in terms of developing that and small capital and we're continuing working with universities um, through this concept. But we also in Africa, for example, in Kenya, we focus on sports and, uh, and kids in slums uh, as a connection to life skills and we integrate employability skills and we work with almost 30,000 youth in slums just completely transforming the way they uh, see themselves in the future through mind, sports and life skills activities. So use is very important area of impact for us. And um, number three is maternal child health. We believe that the communities um, that are, um, the well-being of communities dependent on the well-being of uh, women and children in particular. Um, and um, that's kind of our, our uh, key impact area and so we tend to enter a country and work across the three usually with livelihoods first and, and um, that's where we see that we're making the biggest difference in the long term. So, um, yeah, so we have a, a strategic goal to reach one million people directly and we have about 654,000 people directly impact now in the last eight years. Okay, so we talked a little bit about Myanmar. 70% um, live in a rural area, which is still where most of the poverty is. Um, we're working in an area called Shan State, um, which is, if you don't know where Myanmar is, yeah, that's where we're working on. It's sort of a, one of the most important economic area. It's a lot of, I think, minority, but it's peaceful. It has been peaceful for um, now about seven years, um, and um, the, it's an economic corridor into both north and south and east uh, into the country, and, and so the reason why we chose that area, not only because we had our core livelihood program there, so we knew the communities very well and were established there for a long time, is because also this is, as uh, Eliza said, a pilot, which we want to be scalable, and we want also to be able to show um, stakeholders holders like the government that if this is working there and making an impact, how can we work with you um, and uh, with other NGOs to actually replicate it elsewhere. So um, it's the area where we work um, is um, impacted about 80,000 people. Uh, we work in 150 villages um, and there's a regional hospital that is our partners. And they effectively are the center for all of the training, capacity building, and kind of the delivery of the work with the midwives and the health workers. Um, this is a little bit about the information, kind of the context of global health issues in Myanmar. Um, so almost 50% of the children in the particular area where we work, and in some areas in Myanmar are actually worse are what's considered malnourished. So most of that means that a lot of them lack significantly iron as the mother basic um, nutritional um, deficiency, which means that they are, both their development is really stunted, but also it affects a lot of their other capacity, including mental capacity when they reach, for example, five years of age and they are um, in school. Um, <coughs> For every 100,000 birth, 227 women die. Um, in the US, it's about uh, 
11, 12, I think the numbers have been higher in the US recently. In Israel, just for the comparison, it's five. Interestingly enough, in Israel, in the 50s, the numbers were exactly the same as Myanmar today. Uh, so it's pretty transformational. It's now one of the laws in the world. Um, 40 out of 1,000 infants died before reaching one year of age. This is the official statistic. Now there are issues with official statistics in Myanmar because they're completely unreliable. Um, Eliza will share with you in the one when we were there, the head doctor wasn't there. She can share a little bit about her impressions and they had a sub-doctor. We had a team of doctors there doing the capacity building. There were at least three babies that would have died on that week uh, from direct kind of um, issues of lack of understanding of how to take uh, emergency deliveries, how to address specific uh, problems. There was one that was actually a woman that was actually safe, uh, bleeding almost to death. Um, and this is like a weekly or daily situation. So the real statistics in rural area are probably much, much worse than what is being reported. WHO just issued the, um, a report this year which Myanmar government has not endorsed saying uh, putting Myanmar one of the lowest in the world behind a lot of the African countries. Um, again, Myanmar government officially is very much against this report and feels that it's an unfair assessment of the situations, but I think the real numbers are pretty close to that. Um, Still, only 37% of the births are delivered to the hospital. There's a lot of push to actually uh, improve that statistic because a lot of the issues with complicated deliveries are happening in village setting. And so our project is actually targeting both kind of the, what's happened in the hospital, but also what happens in the villages and trying to really move that referral to the hospital in a much more effective way. Um, and then this is kind of where we are looking at the next stage because there's a lot of wider issues such as lack of knowledge and capacity building and wider sort of sexual and reproductive health, illegal abortions, uh, significant issues around gender-based violence have been particularly coming uh, to light uh, with uh, the Rohingya crisis and we heard a lot of that, uh, but it's there and been always there. Um, and so kind of this is going to be what we, some of the uh, issues we're going to be looking at at the next stage as well. Um, so what is our solution? Uh, and uh, we have done a lot of assessment because we're not the only one operating there. We're a tiny organization. You know, all of the others, like Save the Children or whatever you, you know, are there doing different things. Um, and so we had to really narrow down where we can make the most impact given how Rotary operates and how we operate. Um, and um, we've decided to focus on three, ar three areas, and this is together with our communities and assessing the needs, um, where we felt that the gaps are really there and we can make them the most impact. One is to improve the detection, referral, and management of high-risk pregnancies, specifically focusing on some of the leading causes to um, maternal mortality, such as undetected, um, diabetes um, and, and other things. And then um, improved management of child development delays um, because a lot of them as a, as a result of poor birth outcomes, but also as a result of some of the wider issues around nutrition that are being really major focus of some of the other international development organizations. And actually that allows us to go into the community and work with the auxiliary midwives without saying to them, you need to focus on medical things because we don't want the, the midwives in the villages to, um, to have too much work around high-risk pregnancies. That's where we see a lot of the issues. We want them to be able to work very closely with the community, to really with the families in a holistic way to support the wider community health and the child development and education, including things like hygiene and sanitation. And one of the ways that you can do that and then refer to the hospital for the high-risk pregnancies as soon as possible and be able to detect those much quicker than what's happening now. Um, and the third and very cool aspect of this grant is model technology. So we actually have an integrated health, and as you can imagine, you know, computer system health-based 
that we did there. So interesting enough, as I said, when I arrived there six years ago, you couldn't get a cell phone at all. It's basically a very limited number of people had access to cell phones. The whole country is now 3G wired. People have no water or electricity, but they have cell phones. They have Chinese cell phones and they have access to internet. And that allows you an incredible tool in all kinds of ways, one of which is health. So there's a lot of uh, uh, the existing framework that allows you to build on that to actually manage patients' um, health, to provide training and capacity building that allows the midwives or the health workers that are in the field put in some information and they will tell them, standardizing their care, okay, this is, there's a red flag here, this child is not doing what it's supposed to be doing, there might be some issues that you haven't done, you have to be referring, you have to be doing this, or this is the type of emergencies, training, capacity building that you need to do, or steps you need to follow in this situation, and this is what we're doing. It also gives us much more accurate data and ability to really uh, because it's a quite a wide rural area with difficult access, really to understand how uh, we're impacting the area. So it's a, it's a different type of uh, opportunity, and this uh, mobile application support is something that the local community is incredibly excited about. Um, okay, so we started the project in July, August 2018, working across the three areas that I mentioned. Um, on the high-risk pregnancies, this is now you see photos from the actual delivery, um, from the recent uh, trainings. Every quarter there's a training of the experts that are coming for the e for the particular areas, and then alongside it there's ongoing capacity building, what we call train of trainers model. So we are training 150 midwives and health workers, and they have to be training the rest of their um, peers, um, and then they are working on an ongoing basis to deliver the care that we are sort of supporting them on and so we get a loop of feedback and then we can adapt the next capacity building stage to be better uh, and more addressing the particular gap. So on the high risk pregnancy they're working on things like um, more, um, bleeding, uh, abnormal delivery, postpartum care, all of those things that are, right now they're missing, they have gaps in knowledge. Um, we also developed a very cool kit, which I actually use quite widely in the field, um, which is one of the things that are great about Rotary is that Rotary allows you to provide equipment. So it's not just capacity building knowledge, <coughs> they're able to provide something very specific kids that allow the midwives to um, hear heartbeat and monitor heartbeat of the baby, something that is uh, so natural for anybody here. They, the only thing they had before in the field is those, uh, those things which doesn't allow you to monitor anything and to see that if something is happening that is wrong. Um, like, yeah. Um, and so now they're both measuring the, the uh, sugar level in the blood, they're able to use the urine analysis stick to see if something going on like preeclampsia or eclampsia with women, which is the number one killer uh, of mothers in pregnancy, and uh, measuring blood pressure, and, um, and using the uh, Dopplers to actually hear uh, the heartbeat. And in addition to all that, we also uh, supply uh, monitors um, to monitor, um, to be able to, in the hospital, to be able to monitor mm -hmm. the women who are arriving there uh, and identify the high risk. Um. Quick question for you. Yeah. Um, obviously, it's great to be able to monitor the, the, the vitals of the mother and the baby, but so much of that's based on, uh, the results that's based on nutrition of the mother. Um, do you, how do you help manage the nutrition mother so she gets the, the foods that she needs. So one of our uh, team members, the expert, is this um, public health nurse who has been, who is almost 80 and actually was one of the founders in Israel of this uh, drop of milk model in the 50s. She's Dutch and she's doing a lot of work on uh, basically 
doing a mapping of the local available resources for nutrition and then teaching the midwives and the community and the, um, and the health workers in the villages of how to help uh, guide the mothers into what they should be eating from what is available and creating a lot of kind of uh, simple tools. Um, and um, yeah, that's kind of a lot of the training that we do with the community education is around nutrition. Um, okay, so child development, um, and unfortunately my colleague couldn't be here today, but uh, we have uh, somebody else who is uh, on the International Committee of Mercer Island who is a child development specialist, and she supports the child development part of it. Um, one of the cool things that we have done is identify the local organization that actually builds wooden toys um, and work with them to create a kit, a child development kit for um, the local midwives, which is the first time it's being done in the country. Um, and then um, looking at one of the things that um, they do there is that they wrap the babies very tight and they keep them wrapped for a very long time. Um, and so, oh, because often the, the women will carry them on their back to do field work, and so you won't see that there's an issue with the baby from the birth, and they're not seen by the doctor for a very long time. And so you won't see that there's any issues with the baby until they're maybe a year old or older. And so this is kind of allowing this process of identification and management of any uh, challenges with the baby happen much, much sooner, and also really teaching the community and the, and the health workers <coughs> how to, what is a normal or normal development look like, um, and how to support in, in helping children to progress. Um, and mobile technology, this is actually a picture of, uh, of the midwives downloading the code with the application. Um, there is a, a tool here that is used widely, not just here, across the world, it's called HEADS. It's a milestone assessment tool. Um, it standardizes, uh, standardizes the ability of uh, you know, any sort of um, medical personnel to assess a child. We got an in-kind support where they actually translated and adapted the tool to Myanmar. It's now being tested through this project. Um, and there's a lot of interest around the world to see what happens because it's, it's never, you know, it's never been implemented before in Myanmar. Um, and there's been some interesting adaptations that have to be done. For example, obviously things like does your child pick up, um, you know, cereal from the table? Well, they don't make cereal, they eat rice. So we have to <laughs> do a lot of different adaptations. But effectively, they're using this tool now we're working through some of the technical issues, but now 50 out of 80 midwives already have this application. Is the percentage of delays very high? Yes. And so then what happens? Do they have an education system or services for them? Or um, so there is a lot of push now from above to create um, a sort of an education system for specialists. So we're working on this level. There needs to be a lot of work done on actually developing the specialist work. There's almost no specialist in, in disability areas altogether. Um, but uh, we're creating the first step. So we are basically allowing them to learn how to identify and work on the basic things, like the things that they can do through uh, you know, exercises or support systems. And then it's going to be working on advocacy level to actually support the knowledge or the institutional knowledge, which is lacking right the now. Issues are huge. In this yeah. You can only affect. We have about ten minutes. Okay. Good. So we are just in time. You can talk a little bit about the impact and. Uh, yeah. Um, so and this, this is when um, Liza in uh, Myanmar. Yeah. In so January. Yes. So I went for the second training, um, which is great because it's get out to the villages. Um, and I went with another fellow, or here's uh, Colin Hennessy, his wife Lynn, and Heather Russell. So there's four Rotarians from Fashion that went. Um, Colin is also on the committee at Fashion for this grant. So we've been working pretty much team member on this. And it was really incredible to get out there and actually see this project that we had been working 
working on for two years at that point and see in person. And so we got to catch the tail end of a training. Um, and then earlier that week, though, know, during the training, um, so that one we had, what, four experts that went out on that one? And so they had been there teaching the midwives, and we got to see the, t um, the auxiliary midwives, which we call health workers, actually get trained. And during the week, the, the, we had just missed it, but um, the doctors were actually helping with surgeries with the doctor that had stepped in, like Marie had mentioned earlier. And that's what she was saying that, um, you know, in the middle of the surgery, all of a sudden it was very noticeable that woman was dying. And then there's a great story about the photographer that was there that, was like, you need to go get Ronella now. Like, I need her. And she was in scrubs running down the road, trying to, like, make sure this baby's life was saved. Um, the baby's life was saved, which was great. And so it was really incredible to see, too. So this is Barrett, who she was saying is the global or public health nurse that's there. She's uh, one of the experts that's been going to be going on all three. We've kind of rotated. Um, and so I got to actually go with her to these clinics. There's subclinics and then there's even more rural clinics where, you know, the, the midwives come to the hospital to learn. They're getting taught. And then they go back and teach these health workers and out of their clinic, at their local clinic. And so what Barrett was doing was she stayed an extra two weeks after the training to visit all these clinics and watch the midwives teach, just to make sure that, you know, just to oversee and, and, and really see how the, the information is getting absorbed and being um, executed. And so it was, I mean, so there were times where you'd go in and, uh, you know, the midwives are the ones with the hats. Um, they're the ones that are midwife officials. And then the auxiliary midwives have these new coats on, but they're really proud of what they do. They like themselves great. Um, and so it's really neat to see. You know, I, I have to say there's a little thing here. It's actually the thing that they're part of this project. They have the Rotary, um, all the projects, a drop of milk. Yeah. And they're really proud to be part of this. And uh, they, they, they feel that they have a mission, learn. that they have a mission very exciting to see that. And so, and, and it was incredible too, when we get there, women would be waiting to, they, they, to see the midwives and um, they'd all be lined up. And I mean, all of them were just pretty much ready to have a baby. <laughs> and, um, and then we also got to, to see, so the bee, who's the one that couldn't be here, um, she's a child development specialist. And so that was one of the first times that she really got to, um, that women do <coughs> coming to do the assessment and and teach, and so there was a really big amount of um, people that would come for that part, and so that was children from, you know, infant to five years old, and then she was teaching the midwives and showing them how to use the kit, seeing the different levels of the children. Um, so this and is the kids, and they're all local, locally yeah. made, local materials, local toys, done through a, a organization that was doing And so this is Rebecca too. She um, she was help facilitating the application process. Um, she was a BU um, blog master fellow that yeah. got a fellowship to come and be part of this project to help with the application. And so she's monitoring um, how that's going, and she's actually creating questions and updating them. So it was really incredible to see how much adaptation goes into the, a project like this. You know, there's been a lot of things where we're like, okay, this. Is in the beginning, but now this is the step, what is the need and how do we adapt and then how do we work budgets in the road, on the rotary side. And, um, and so this um, this is a picture of the women that were actually, they get little tests after their exams and that's part of the part where we can start collecting the evaluation and data aspect of it. So every, as, every training, um, every uh, uh, equipment that is being given, um, there is constant monitoring of impact, and that's kind of our quality insurance. Um, so this was a, a just in the, from our recent report, an extract from pre-post test on the knowledge acquired from the tr particular unit on the training of the child development milestones, but actually we are you know, monitoring Use of equipment, we're monitoring both on ongoing basis and on 
um, each of the unit of the training. And, you know, we're not perfect. There's a lot of things that we have been, as Eliza said, that we thought we're doing right, that we didn't do right, and it's okay. And we, first one said, you know, we thought this is what we should be doing, and we made a mistake, let's change it. And that's the cool thing about Rotary Grants, is actually you can do it. Um, and it's part of kind of your ability to rethink as you go along and, and adapt, and the next time do it much better because we're much smarter. Um, and so, yeah, so uh, we are kind of, this is kind of the, also the nice thing about the relationship between, the close relationship between Eliza and TAG is that we're constantly meeting and evaluating uh, what we're doing and trying to figure out how to do it better. And that's a major part of reporting back to the professional was just the keeping the monitoring and evaluation and the measurements of success. That's just on the Rotary side, that's a big thing that they report is how you report back on your grants. And this is just uh, showing you uh, very quickly kind of we integrated lots of different aspects into mobile technology based on what they were asking for. So not just what we wanted, but they really wanted the midwives to have more access to emergency situations. Like what do I do when a child is injured or bleeding because they're in the field and so they can sort of put in some information very quickly and things come up like CPR on newborns. So we taught them CPR on newborns because they were shaking babies. Uh, when baby would come out not breathing, they would shake them. And, um, and actually and this, we have seen this, this happening. How, yeah, and this is how quickly Farid adapted to the second training that I was at, is that I actually saw, she's like, go collect empty water bottles. And so she had them go get tons of empty water bottles or soda bottles, and then when he got to the point where she was training them, she handed one out, and she showed them, so you know, the whole room's <laughs> She's like, this is how you pump, and you put your finger only halfway down to the bottle, and they're all, that's how they learn. But you know, it was just using what was there, and so, yeah. And this is something that we didn't even include, because we assumed, <laughs> I mean, if they're learning for two years to be a midwife, surely they know baby CPR, so, Okay. A lot of respect for those people's time. It is quarter after. Uh, anybody who'd like to, to stay, I'd like to hear the rest of the presentation, uh, but I just want to let people know that uh, the meeting is you know, quarter I just after. Want to, we're Sorry, done. I just want to make a quick announcement too. Oh, yeah. I should have done it earlier, but Bash on Murray is doing an awesome fundraiser this summer called Blues and Blues. So if anyone likes okay. music, um, it's June 29th, and um, if you're interested, just chat with me. Send an email, we'll make sure we get it out. Yeah, yeah. we did. Yeah. 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 Yes, okay. And on the fundraiser front, we're also raising money for this <laughs> content. Yeah. Uh -huh. We're going to have a, actually an exhibition um, of all of the work that we've done. And Eliza is going to be speaking again uh, with some other really nice photographer and the child development specialist. So sharing about the work is going to be on the 13th of uh, June. And we'll send out the information as well. We hope you can join us. Um, and um, um, this is just very quickly showing you some images. This is from the life saving surgeries where our uh, team is really working with the doctors to improve their knowledge also on emergency obstetric care, not just in the villages. Right, and one assessment that was happening is that we're sending this whole referral system to the hospital, but realizing the hospital is lacking. And so that was a big adjustment in the beginning of writing the grant, is we were like, wow, we actually need to provide this is the woman whose baby was saved. Um, okay, so here's the overall impact that the project is trying to achieve. Quite substantial. Um, and um, yeah, so, so those are basically your metrics of success. Yes. For this? Part of it, yeah, yeah, and so that's where this app is really handy coming in because we can it's set up all in the app to the monitoring evaluation part, um, which like tag naturally does anyway, so it's been a pretty seamless thing. But just as I said, from the rotary side, that's kind of a big part of the global grant process. Is once you get approved, there's still certain things that they require. And, um, so with, with additional, you're obviously open to other clubs getting involved with this. What would be what would be uh, what would be involvement for us? How would we become involved? If you're happy with this? So this project is we're getting near halfway through, and so we are already. We are, we are, we are, we are. July will be here. 
How long is it for two years? No, 18, 18 months. months. So we, and so we, we're hearing yeah. after the next phase. We've been, we need to yeah, we've been having lunch. lots of meetings of, you know, we definitely want to do a next phase. It's just yeah. dialing in the details. Yeah. And so it's kind of like once we get to that point, then we're definitely like, trying to reach out to the clubs of who's going to be interested. And then it's going to be more carrying on with us, which gives the opportunity for returning to visit the project. It's kind of okay. like the level of how involved we can be. And so, you know, we'll be still the lead, but then it would just be getting on board with the project. And that's, so we're not quite there yet, but we're definitely getting close. So some of the things that we've been focusing on, that was a big discussion just this past Monday, was, um, you know, are we gonna stay in the region and expand, or are we potentially looking into going to another region? And so the doctor that was working at the main hospital that kind of was a pioneer of this project got transferred to a different and so it's, and that's okay. Like we're working with a new doctor. She's wonderful. She's great. We got feedback from her for the next training that's coming up. And she's like, hey, I think we should add in these different things. And so we're adapting the curriculum right now. We're looking into getting a different expert to cover those, to go on the trip as well. Oh, um, nice. Twenty-five hours of really good. But you could do lots of fun things there. Yeah. Eliza did a whole time for me a no, it's not. Well, that's not. not. <laughs> but you did like the, you know, you went to the beach, you went to the beach. Yeah, we went to the lake, we went to the gun. You get to do some fun, not just. Yeah. Um, although this is but the, the, the thing was, is, um, I mean, I've worked on projects like this outside Rotary. I always find that going on a project, or going on a trip like this, the project is the most impactful that you carry with you. And my friend, fellow Rotarian Heather, came, and I kind of was saying that, I'm like, yeah, blown away by the project part, but afterwards, even after all the stuff we saw and all the things we did, she was like, that was definitely the most special. And so, because we did, I mean, it's not like crime to the crime. You're right, we rode in back the pickup trucks and we went up to the villages, but just to really be there and see it and see the people and actually, it's, that's what's, that's what it was for. That's all the two year work. That was, that was really rewarding. Question about the bash on the rotary. How are you getting young people like yourself? <laughs> well, I am the only one. <laughs> 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 no, I've been doing very well. Get involved in international brands and you'll see young people come. I had another friend who was in rotary and she was really involved in doing international projects, getting fashion a partner. There used to be other people who were doing them as well. This is our first one that we've done like without our other people so it's really exciting that we're kind of getting ourselves on the map again um, and that's what drew me in was the international work and just realizing like how Rory as an organization works and so you know just the partnering and the funds that get matched and that you come up with a certain amount of funds but that gets multiplied by like 2.5 it's just kind of like a no-brainer for me I was like what so that's what brought me in and then I'm getting more so you raise money, money but you actually able to get almost three times the money you raise for every project, so the impact is incredible. And I think for younger generation, um, being able to actually lead projects like that on behalf of Rotary, because really Eliza leads it. We kind of are the implementing partner, but the lead and the person who says, okay, we're going to make a decision at the end of the day whether it's gonna go this way or not, is the Rotary, not us. So it's a uniquely, um, special, I think, the development opportunity and, and an attraction. So if you want young people, get involved in the local grants. All right, there you go. Well, hey, we thank you so much for joining us, and especially the effort you made to come across on the ferry this morning. We appreciate that. But this has been a wonderful presentation. We're looking Join us for this project going forward. We're looking for different ways to, uh, to get more boots on the ground involved in the international projects. We have in the past, we have it for a Quite a few years. Um, yeah. It's been more writing yeah. checks. Yeah. Oh, the slash so, project? Mm -hmm. No. Oh, yeah, it's been it's been a while. Like four years. All right. Well, thank you very very much. Thank you. And thank you. Oh, wow. Sorry. That was a wonderful day. That was a little too exuberant. Okay. Thank you all. Thank you. Well,